And so another thing you should do when you're starting off uh, setting up the new website design is make sure you get a hold of all the assets you already have, right? So collect the brand guidelines, collect any logos, collect the images, fonts, brand colors, any existing creative, if you have videos, pictures, images, any website copy, you know, the text of the website, that should all be collected. And then you should kind of do a brand survey, kind of look at all that content and try and make it uh, make it consistent with each other, right, as much as possible. Uh, and that kind of helps you to uh, start to think about how you're going to redesign the website. Fonts are important, right? The type that you're gonna use, and you should think carefully about which font reflects your brand. For instance, Comic Sans, right? This kind of like drawing, kind of like kids drawing type of font has a very different impression than something like Helvetica. Um, and varying the font can indicate things like importance. So you can have different text sizes, different text colors, different weights. That means how big or bold the font is, capitalization, italics. All these things uh, can help indicate it. And as much as possible, you should stick to what are known as web safe fonts. There's easy resources out there that can help you identify those and try and figure out which ones. And these are ones that are agreed on standard. They're supposed to be supported by most of the major uh, web browsers. When it comes to actually creating the website, right, the one, I'm not going to talk too much about the actual method of building the website. We'll talk some examples about how you could do that in some technologies uh, later on. But um, the one big thing you have to decide is, are you going to create a static website that remains relatively the same over time until a web developer revises it, which is easy to maintain, obviously, because there's not much going on, or are you going to use a content management system? And a content management system really divorces the design of the website from the content and allows people, anyone who's even non-developer, to update the content frequently, right? So WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, these are examples of content management websites. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those when we talk about some of the tech demos as we go forward. Um, you may also need to consider server-side and client-side languages, but these are, and what we mean by that is things like the way the, the the website is actually encoded when it's presented to the user or stored on your website, on your web server. But those are often dictated by your choice of a CMS if you're using it. And so they're not as critical a decision as they used to be, right? Um, and you know, I just really want to emphasize that the point of a CMS, right, is to allow people to kind of write web pages who can't do any, who don't know anything about HTML. So for instance, a manager could update a product description just in a database and then that product description would be reflected directly onto the website later that day, right? That's the example of what a content management system provides to you. You should, of course, be considering your mobile strategy, right? How much of the web is, uh, uh, is how much of the time are you gonna spend on website development for the mobile, right? We talked about mobile first in, in the user experience talk. And that means that most websites nowadays are designed around the idea that the user is first gonna see the website on a mobile device. Uh, any user can access the mobile web, which is a positive experience, but you have less control over the experience because you can't actually control the browser and the phone and everything like that, right? A mobile app is another strategy to go, and it should be considered whether the user should be moved to a mobile app on a mobile device. Should you push the, the user from the web to the app, right? And so, for instance, Yelp, when you pull up their mobile website, has an open in the Yelp app button right away because they want to push you from the mobile web to the mobile app because they have more control over it, they have more data. Um, but, you know, the downside is only users who can, who download the app actually have access to it. Like, if I haven't installed the Yelp app, this button just forces me to go install it, which may mean that I just stop using Yelp at that point, right? One solution that kind of bridges the gap between uh, the mobile device and the desktop device is responsive design. And responsive design is the idea that the websites can be designed in such a way they can be viewed on any platform. And so the content automatically shifts around as necessary to be viewed on different platforms. Um, you need to think about how much of your traffic is coming from mobile. Nowadays, an increasing amount. Do desktop users have the same goals? So a mobile, a responsive design website is gonna have the same content on a mobile device as a desktop device. It's just gonna look different in terms of where it is, right? Uh, and so if they have different goals, you might wanna not use responsive design. There's three key characteristics that really allow responsive design. Flexible grid means that the, the grid size can snap and change, and I'll show you what that looks like. Media queries that allow content to be pulled dynamically. So if, for instance, when you redesign, when you move 
uh, from the desktop to the web, you have a much, or mobile, you have a much smaller window, right? Then it can automatically pull the correct content to fill in that space, right? Um, whereas if it was fixed, right, it might distort the content, right? So it's gonna pull it into a particular space as opposed to pulling in a particular preformatted structure of text. And then flexible images, right? So when you go from the desktop to the mobile, you need to change the dimensions of some of the images. And so you need to make sure your images are set up for that. So one example that I like to use is ESPN. If you go on ESPN, just go on the desktop browser and you just move and change the size of your browser, you'll see this right away. If you have a nice big and wide, you get like three columns and you get lots of information going on and there you have your favorites and you have the ticker tape and everything like that for the content, right? If you go to a smaller setup, you'll notice two of the columns go away, but the content is still somewhat similar. So this top part about the Warriors and the Thunder is still there in both. The top headlines, which used to be in the right column, moves to the middle, and then the next story is right there below it, right? And so that's an example of responsive design. It's a flexible grid because there's these grid objects, but the grid objects move around based upon how you make the screen bigger or smaller. You should design the site or the app around your marketing goals, which means understanding your site users, right? And if you're gonna do mobile web design, you should always include the essentials, contact details, direct your map, the basics of who you are, and whenever possible, using a click to call link, right, to provide them with immediate access to what's going on. Now you should think carefully about branded applications, right? The nice thing about branded applications is because they are specific to a platform, you have a lot more control, uh, but you have to build a free software platform, so you need a different Android app and a different iOS app, right? The user experience can be much more powerful in a branded app uh, than it is in a mobile web, but discoverability, right, the fact that you have these app stores that are walled gardens may mean that it's hard to discover your app, right? Whereas for a mobile web, they can just search and surf directly to it. I just want to leave you with this note that even the most boring companies in some respects in terms of the products that they make can create very engaging apps. So here are two of my favorite ones, right? So um, Charmin, right, that developed this whole idea around a sit or squat app. And this was an app that basically allowed you to rate the cleanliness of public toilets, right? There's nothing, like they're not selling toilet paper on this app, they're not involving um, you know, direct sales in any way, but they're, in, they're increasing the brand awareness and they're increasing the brand engagement, right? They're providing utility that users can actually use, even though it has nothing to do with actually them purchasing the product at this point, right? Another example is uh, Pampers. You know, Pampers is, it has an app that's not targeted to people who are actually buying diapers, but to people who are about to buy diapers, right? And basically it's this pregnancy calendar that shows that how your baby looks at different stages along the way, right? And what your baby's doing, it provides all this information, right? The idea here is not to sell diapers directly with the app, but rather to provide information that will encourage people to remember the Pampers brand so that when they didn't go out and buy these uh, brands, they, the, the, the diapers, they think of Pampers first. In both of these cases, right, I think these are very innovative apps that take somewhat boring products and, you know, diapers and toilet paper and created branded apps that had fairly good adoption of them. And I think they're excellent examples of how even uh, the most boring brands can capitalize on these things. So uh, that's it for website design and uh, look forward to seeing some tutorials on how to use some of these tools.